Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. So today we're going to review this device here, the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. Now this device is the successor to the Retroid Pocket 2, which came out in summer of 2020. And that original device was one of the first retro handhelds that I ever owned. And unfortunately, the original Retroid Pocket 2 never really connected with me. Part of that had to do with the D-pad and the face buttons, but I also didn't like the unintuitive software experience and the lack of a touchscreen. Well, I'm happy to report that this updated version is miles better than its predecessor. And on top of that, it's selling at a killer price of $100 before shipping. And so a lot of people have been anticipating this release mostly because of that price point. Because when it comes to a device under $100, this blows every other thing out of the water. And so today we're going to do a deep dive review of the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus and see how it performs with everything from classic systems like the Nintendo and Super Nintendo, as well as some of those systems that are a little bit trickier to emulate, things like Nintendo 64 and Dreamcast. And finally, we'll try to push the limits and see how it does with GameCube and PlayStation 2. And I think in the context of this price, you're going to be really impressed too. And I'm expecting this to be a pretty long video, so grab a cup of coffee and maybe some good and plenties, and let's get started. As always, we'll talk about the technical specifications of this device. Now, I don't want to get too far into the details, but I will say that this has an upgraded CPU and GPU. It has double the RAM of its predecessor, as well as four times as much internal storage. The display is still 3.5 inches with a 640 by 480 resolution, but it's quite a bit brighter and it also is a touchscreen. The battery life on this has been greatly improved as well. I get at least six hours of playtime, but sometimes up to eight hours. In terms of features, this has 2.4 and 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi, Bluetooth 5.0, an internal gyroscope, HDMI out, and a working sleep function. And in terms of operating system, it ships with Android 9.0 with a custom front end launcher. So now let's jump into an unboxing. And I gotta admit, as soon as this went up on sale for pre-order, I ordered a bunch of stuff. So I ordered two different units as well as an upgraded PCB that I can put into my old shell, along with new buttons and a touchscreen so that I can also upgrade my previous one to a 2 Plus as well. But for this video, I'm just gonna focus on these two units here. In the box, you're gonna get a user's guide, a USB-C cable, as well as a glass screen protector. So this first unit here is called Indigo and it's reminiscent of the Nintendo GameCube. One of the biggest improvements they've done with this 2 Plus model is they've added conducted rubber buttons. And as you can see, they stick out quite a bit from the shell and they have a nice bit of travel to them. And these feel really good. They're light and springy. They remind me of Pow Kitty RGB 10 buttons. And like with the original, the stick on the right here is a slider. We'll talk more about that in a bit. The home start and select buttons feel the same. They're nice and clicky. And like with the face buttons, the D-pad has been greatly improved as well. This has conductive rubber connections and has a good amount of travel and pivot to it. To me, this is miles better than the original Retroid Pocket 2. And again, it feels a lot like a Pow Kitty RGB 10 D-pad. It's light and springy. The D-pad has a little bit of texture to it. Not a lot, but you definitely can feel a tiny bit of grit here. And same thing with the face buttons. They have a tiny bit of grit to them as well. Overall, I would say they are smooth buttons, but they do have just a little bit of texture to them too. Up top, we have the signature stacked shoulder buttons of the Retroid Pocket 2. It doesn't feel like these have been changed in any way. The shoulder buttons are clicky, but the triggers themselves, they're a little bit mushy feeling. Not a lot going on the back, just the logo here. So let's look at the other device that I bought. This one's called the 16-bit model. And this is the one that I'm gonna use for testing in this video. In a first glance, the face buttons look the same. They have the same amount of travel and distance here, and the D-pad feels exactly the same as the other unit. Same thing with these shoulders and triggers. I'm a big fan of the fact that they stack them like on the Nintendo Switch. On the bottom, we have a headphone jack as well as an SD card slot. Now this one's covered with a little piece of rubber, and just like with the Retroid Pocket 2, it's a pain in the butt to get open and then close it again but luckily you don't have to really access it that often. Up top, we have a micro HDMI output, USB-C for data and charging, volume button, power buttons, and an LED indicator. Now let's go back to the face buttons on this model in particular. After using it for a few minutes, I realized that some of these buttons were a lot rougher to push down on, and the yellow B button in particular tended to stick if I push it down too much. It just felt like the buttons were a little bit too big for the shell. They just kept getting caught and stuck. And I actually kept it this way for a few days to see if these buttons would break in, but unfortunately they didn't. They just continued to stick. And so I decided to open it up and do a little bit of investigative surgery. And what I found is that the buttons themselves are just like the regular buttons, but they've been painted. And if you look around the sides of the buttons, you can see a little bit of gray dust. And that's because these buttons are pushing up against the sides of the shell. They're just too thick for the shell itself. I think that by virtue of painting these buttons, they made them just a little bit too thick. 
And so at this point, I had a few different options. I could have sanded down the sides of the buttons or even sanded in the inside of the shell itself, but I didn't really want to do anything that permanent. So instead, I decided to check out the black buttons that came with my PCB upgrade kit. And as you can see, the 16-bit buttons are just a little bit bigger than the black buttons. And so I think that was the culprit for me. So I decided to use the black buttons instead. And it's a real shame because I love the colored buttons on this, but you know what? I'm going to use these for a different project later, so we'll see these again soon. And hopefully this is an issue that Retroid can address later on in the future. Either way, once I installed the new buttons, this is what it ended up looking like. And to be honest, it actually doesn't look half bad. And thankfully, after making this adjustment, there are no issues with the buttons sticking or rubbing at all. And while I was in there, I also swapped out the regular shoulder buttons for black shoulder buttons, as you can see here, just to kind of finish out the look. And so overall, I actually really like the look of this now, this black and white contrast. Now, one thing to note, these buttons are much thicker than the original Retroid Pocket 2 buttons, which you see here on the left. And just for kicks, I decided to install these as well to see what they would look like. And as you can see here, they are way too low. So long story short, these new buttons are a great improvement over the previous ones. Now, looking at the back of the device, you can see that the text here is basically illegible. And I had the same problem with my orange unit that I had bought in 2020. And one thing to note as well is that all of the logos still say Retroid Pocket 2 and not Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. And honestly, I don't really mind it. I like the fact that they're reusing shells instead of getting new ones. Now, the device comes with two front-facing stereo speakers, and they sound pretty good. They're both loud and clear. I wish they had a little bit more bass, but overall, they're pretty good quality. So yeah, overall, from a hardware perspective, I think they made some really nice improvements to this device. The D-pad in particular is vastly improved. And it's funny how just one little D-pad can transform a device from something that I'd rather not play to something that I look forward to playing with. And they nailed it with this one. The analog stick is about the same as it was on the previous device. It sticks out a little bit more than I would like, and it kind of makes it hard to slip in and out of your pocket comfortably. On top of that, the stick does not click down for an L3 button. Another signature feature of this device is the analog stick being above the D-pad. And people have mixed feelings about this. Honestly, it's not something that I really lose a lot of sleep over, but I know some people do prefer to have their D-pad in alignment with the face buttons. But honestly, with a device this small, it doesn't feel that bad. Especially with the stacked shoulder buttons, it gives you a place to put your index fingers. Overall, I find this to be a comfortable device to hold on to, no matter if I'm using the D-pad or the analog stick. Speaking of analog sticks, now let's talk about that right analog slider. Now on the original Retroid Pocket 2, this was an 8-way digital slider, and it has been improved with the 2 Plus. It now is an analog slider. But all the same, I'm not a big fan of using a slider in place of a joystick. I think the idea here was to make it lower seated so that way it wouldn't interfere with the face buttons. But from my perspective, that's not an issue that I often have with retro handheld devices. My thumbs tend to just work around it anyway. And so unfortunately, I think this was a feature that no one really needed or wanted. And I'm hoping that with the Retroid Pocket 3, they will change this from being a slider to an actual analog stick. And finally, the face buttons themselves have been greatly improved as well. I like the fact that they have a membrane connection to them, and my fingers tend to fatigue less with these buttons than they did with the original. Another thing worth noting is that the SD cards are still a pain in the butt to get out on these devices. Not only is it hard to push down and have the card eject, but it's also hard to pull the card itself out of the slot too. And definitely not the end of the world, but it is a pet peeve of mine and I thought it was worth mentioning. Okay, let's talk about weight. This weighs 200 grams altogether. And in this segment, I'm going to compare the 2 Plus against other devices that have a 480p or higher resolution display. And among all of those other devices, the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus is quite a bit lighter than all of them. And I honestly really enjoy the lightness of this device. It makes it feel just that much easier to carry around. Personally, I like to have devices that feel lightweight and a little bit cheap just because it reminds me of my childhood. And in that sense, the Retroid Pocket 2 nails it out of the park. In terms of size comparison, the Retroid Pocket 2 most resembles the RG351MP, the metal premium version from Ambernick. Of course, there are some differences. The D-pad and analog sticks are swapped, and the Ambernick face buttons are quite a bit bigger and closer together. On top of that, the RG351MP has a true right analog stick. It's also about the same size as the Game Force Chi, but this one has its own set of drawbacks, including some analog sticks that are not that great, as well as face buttons that have a little bit too much play but it does have some cool RGB lighting. It's about the same size as the RG351V when laid on its side. These both have 640x480 displays, but obviously because of the form factor, the RG351V is quite a bit different of a device. It only has one analog stick and a mono speaker, and then the shoulder and trigger buttons are hidden in the back of the device itself. 
In terms of face buttons and D-pad, the Pal Kitty RGB 10 Max 2 resembles the 2 Plus the most, but this one has a widescreen 16x9 display, and it also has stacked shoulders and triggers. And of all the previous generation devices, the ones that use the RK3326 chipset, this is my favorite among them, and most of that has to do with the large size and the ergonomics. Moving along, the PS Vita is only a little bit larger than the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus, despite having a beautiful 16x9 5-inch display. And the Switch Lite is quite a bit bigger with a 5.5 inch display here, but a lot of plastic around it as well. And compared to the biggest one of all, the Ambernic RG552, this one is quite a bit smaller. Now the RG552 is Ambernic's latest device, and this one costs over twice as much as the 2 Plus, despite having a slightly slower chipset. But it does have the same design language as the other Ambernic devices, for example the face buttons a D-pad or a line, and it has true clickable analog sticks. And so you might be wondering why the Ambernic device costs so much, and almost all of it has to do with this high resolution, beautiful touchscreen display on the 552. And I've gone into detail about this in my other videos, so I'm not going to belabor the point here, but when you're specifically talking about screen quality between these two recent releases, the Ambernic display is just heads and shoulders above the Retroid Pocket 2 display. In terms of quality and color saturation and even overall brightness, I think the 552 wins hands down. And playing something simple like a Game Boy Advance game is just a marvel when it comes to a large display like this. It's definitely nowhere close to the original experience of playing a Game Boy Advance, but all the same, it is really impressive. And honestly, the Retroid Pocket 2 is just a different approach here. This is more of a compact and smaller handheld, and so because of that, the display is going to reflect that. Now compared to something with the same size screen, the RG351MP has a little bit better color saturation, and in terms of color balance, it makes the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus look a little bit more green than it could be. But overall, these are both great screens, and I think the Retro Pocket 2 Plus is just a little bit brighter as well. And I plan on doing a full comparison video later on down the line, but you know, one of the things about the 351MP as well as the 552 is these lined up shoulder buttons just aren't as ergonomic as something like the stacked shoulder buttons on the Retro Pocket 2 Plus. Now comparing the Pal Kitty Max 2 here, you can also see that the color saturation is much more vibrant on the Max 2, to the point where it's a little bit oversaturated, but personally I like that. Now one other next-gen device that recently came out is the Pal Kitty X18S, and this is kind of apples and oranges here because this is a clamshell device. And despite being more powerful and costing $170, this device is inferior to the 2 Plus in several key ways. Number one is the ergonomics. These also have lined up shoulder buttons and triggers, and they're just terrible. On top of that, the D-pad, the analog sticks, and the face buttons were so bad that I had to go in and make hardware modifications to them just to make them usable. And I have videos about that if you're interested in checking that out, but all the same, even after making all of those adjustments, I still don't find this device very fun to play. And a lot of that comes down to the ergonomics of playing with a device that has compromised face buttons and D-pad and shoulders and triggers. And so in summary, when it comes to ergonomics, I actually really like the 2 Plus. I love the stacked shoulder buttons and triggers, just like I did with the Retroid Pocket 2. And having your index fingers up top does give you enough room to put the rest of your fingers across the back of the device. If I had one complaint about the device, I wish that it wasn't so boxy and angular. I think that if the back was a little bit more rounded, it would be more comfortable over long play sessions. But overall, I think that's a minor complaint when it comes to a device costing under $100 with this much performance. So long story short, I do think that anyone who buys this device is probably going to be pleasantly surprised with how good it feels in the hand. There are definitely some subjective aspects to the ergonomics, for example the placement of the analog stick and d-pad, but overall I think that the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus has a lot more hits than it does misses when it comes to ergonomics. Okay, so now let's dive into the software side of things. We're going to boot up the device here and see how long it takes, and we'll talk a little bit about the operating system as we go forward. The original Retroid Pocket 2 shipped with an old version of Android. I can't remember at this point what it was, I think it was 6 or 7. But in the year after its release, they did have an official firmware update up to Android 8. And then there was also a Lineage OS custom firmware update available as well. But in my opinion, even those firmware updates weren't enough to really make that device fully usable. A lot of that had to do with the lack of touchscreen, as well as the fact that 1 gig of RAM just isn't enough for an Android device. Now when it comes to boot up time, it's still a bit slow. It takes about 43 seconds to boot up from start to finish, and even then, once you swipe up into the main menu, it'll take a few more seconds to get to something that you can actually navigate. And so here's the main interface here. It's basically a set of tiles that correspond to individual apps. And this is pretty easy to navigate, but they also have an emulation interface, which I like a lot more. And this one here is reminiscent of Emulation Station and has a Nintendo Switch style theme. And I'm a big fan of this front-end launcher here. It allows you to select your system and then navigate to your game and then launch it just like that. 
Now, there are plenty of other third-party solutions that can do something very similar, but I found that this front end is very stable and runs fairly smoothly. And on top of that, when you launch a game into RetroArch or a different emulator, it's surprisingly fast. Look at how fast it is here. And I've already gone into RetroArch and configured all of my settings and hotkeys and things like that. And so I set it to quit RetroArch when I press start and select at the same time. And look at how fast it launches back to the front end. That's super fast. The idea of getting in and out of your games like this is actually super convenient. And honestly, for that reason alone, I tend to use this front end more than anything else. It does take a little bit of time to configure, and I plan on doing a configuration video sometime in the future, but all the same, I'm really happy with this front end. Now, in addition to this tile-based front end here, you can also quit and go into just a regular Android interface too. And so you have a variety of options when it comes to navigating through your apps and games. And one more note to make is that with this front end, if you power off the device and then power it back on, it's actually going to remember what interface you were using previously, so you can basically stay within this emulation station interface the entire time if you'd like. That being said, there are some limitations right now with this front end. For example, it doesn't have Sega Genesis, Sega Saturn, or Nintendo DS, so it's not fully complete. But luckily, the developers are aware of this, and they're working on updates that are over the air. And at this point, they've released four updates in the past week and a half or so, so I think this may be something that does get improved over time. So let's talk a little bit more about this front end from a user perspective. Up on the top left, you can select a nickname as well as a logo, and then also change it from a dark or a light theme. Personally, I like the dark theme just because it seems to complement the colorway that I have for this particular unit. So to add a system to this front end, you go into the systems cog here at the bottom, and then select your system here. And when you add a system, it's going to move it to the very back of the row. So if you want to organize your games, this is how you do it. You basically set them up one at a time. Now, to add your game library, you go into the system and select ROMs, and then select Add, and then navigate to wherever your games are. For me, they're on the SD card in a folder called Games. And within here, I'm going to navigate to the TurboGrafx-16 folder, and then you hold down A for a second to select it. From here, you need to check the path and then select Scan. It's going to scan through that folder, and then it's going to find all of those games. And with any luck, it's going to pick up on this specific file extension, and then also download the box art based on the naming convention that you're using for your ROM. Now, this also lacks some features. For example, you cannot specify what file extensions to look for. So for example, with Super Nintendo, it looks for SMC files and not the more common SFC files. When you open up a systems game for the first time, it's going to ask you to either manually install a core, or it can automatically do it for you, and the auto function actually works pretty well for this device. And so as you saw, it took me about 30 seconds to add TurboGrafx-16 to my menu. It's a relatively painless experience as long as your games are named properly, and if you're willing to trust the default emulator, and in this case it actually worked really well. Now unfortunately, it doesn't work this way every single time. For example, with Neo Geo, because they use an abbreviated name, the front end is not able to pick up on that and automatically download the art. So you're going to have to do that yourself. What you do is you hold down the A button and select box cover, and then select whatever source you want for your art. I'm going to use the games database here. It's going to then search for the name of your file. And right here, it shows King of Fighters 2003. So just long press on the photo and then select download image. Once you're done downloading it, you can exit out of Chrome and it'll take you back to the launcher. And just like that, it's added the art. Now, unfortunately, it's going to squish everything into squares, but all the same, that's how you would add your box art. And while we're in here, let's actually try out King of Fighters 2003 and see how the D-pad functions when it comes to throwing fireballs. I did miss a fireball here and there, but honestly, some of that was probably user error. Overall, I think this D-pad is going to be great for fighting games. So yeah, that's about it for the front end. I'm really happy with just how this works all together. I do wish that there were a couple other systems available, but overall, I'm very pleased with the results. So now let's talk about emulation performance. We'll start with the lower systems and work our way up. When it comes to Game Boy, as you can expect, there are no problems here whatsoever. I did go into RetroArch and configure all of my settings to my liking, and it does take a few minutes, but after you set up your configuration, it's going to save and you're going to be able to launch it that way with the front end. And so across the board, these lighter systems like Game Boy and Game Boy Color, they all work really well. But honestly, these worked great on the Retroid Pocket too. So let's move on to something else. How about Game Boy Advance? This one did have some issues with the original system. You actually had to use a special version of RetroArch just to get it to run smoothly. And this chip can play Game Boy Advance games no problem via the regular RetroArch. You are going to get some black bars at the top and bottom by having to show a 3x2 aspect ratio system with a 4x3 display, but honestly these black bars are very minimal. So at the end of the day, Game Boy Advance is pretty good on the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. It's not the most fitting handheld for this system in particular. I think the RG351MP or M would be a little bit better suited, and especially the RG552. But all the same, I think you'll enjoy it. 
I already showed quite a few NES games earlier in this video, but as you can see here, they're going to play just fine. No problems here with NES. Let's move on to Super Nintendo. And I'm happy to report that this chip can play SNES with no problem. I found that you can use the BSNES core, which is a little bit more accurate, but I found that the SNES 9X core is preferred for me because you can use latency options like a run ahead one, which will just make things a lot more responsive. So in summary, Super Nintendo does run really well on this. In fact, you can use a more accurate core if you'd like, but I do recommend the SNES 9X core just because it does help to improve input latency. So let's move on to Nintendo 64. I'm using the standalone Mupin 64 Plus FZ emulator and it runs really well. In fact, this system is kind of at that threshold where you don't really need to worry about tweaking settings, and this is always my favorite place to be when it comes to emulation. Across the board, all I did was use the default settings, set it to a 640x480 resolution, which is native to this display, and then just booted up every game, and every single game played really well. Even some of the hardest games to emulate, like Cruise in USA or Conker's Fur Day, they had no problems, they actually ran at full speed the entire time. Now, of course, we're limited by the 480p resolution on this display, but all the same, the graphics do look pretty dang good for a Nintendo 64 on here, and I really can't complain about the gameplay. There were a few hiccups when it came to the larger open areas in GoldenEye 007, but for the most part, they were great. The only game I had some real trouble with was Mario Tennis, and that had to do more with the accuracy of the emulation than with the actual game speed at all. This is just a really hard game to emulate. Now, given the fact that Nintendo 64 plays so well, I expected PlayStation 1 to be a breeze, but unfortunately it wasn't. If I tried to play Tekken 3 in RetroArch, even at a 1x resolution, I couldn't get up to full speed. But luckily, it does have the standalone Duck Station emulator, and this one does work better. But all the same, I had problems with many games running at 2x resolution. Now, that's easily remedied by using a 1x resolution with Duck Station. And when using these settings, I had zero problems whatsoever with any game. But all the same, with this type of performance, you would expect to at least get 2x resolution on every single PlayStation 1 game. And I'm not really sure what's going on here, because for all intents and purposes, the 2x resolution of Duck Station on PlayStation should just run fine. But either way, 1x resolution isn't the end of the world if you do want to play some PlayStation games on this device. Now, like I mentioned before, some of these systems are not displayed on the front end launcher right now, but it's a pretty easy fix. All you have to do is just add them to this other tile launcher here. For example, with Sega Saturn, you can just launch the standalone Yabasan Shiro emulator right then and there. Now, this one's a little bit tricky to set up on Android 9. Basically, you have to move the games over to the internal storage on the device and then put them in a specific folder that is detailed in the emulator itself. After that, when you scan the games, they'll pop right up but that does limit how many you can actually store on the device. Now with Sega Saturn, performance was pretty good. The thing about Yabasan Chiro is that it uses an auto frame skip that kind of smooths out performance. And that's because Sega Saturn is actually a system that's very difficult to emulate. Either way, if you just use the default settings and then set it to the native Sega Saturn resolution, you should have pretty good performance across the board. And with some of the games that are easier to emulate, things like Nights into Dreams, you can turn off the auto frame skip if you'd like. You might get some dips here and there, but overall, if you want to see every single frame available, this is the way to do it. Now, another system that doesn't show up on the front end is Nintendo DS. And this one runs really well using the Drastic Emulator. That's a paid emulator. It costs $5, but it's $5 well spent. And Nintendo DS performance is really good on this. You can have high resolution and also turn off frame skip, and it's going to work great even on games that are harder to emulate, things like Golden Sun Dark Dawn. And the way I configured it is to have full screen on the display, and then I can toggle between the two screens using one of my shoulder buttons. And that's what I would recommend if you plan on playing DS on this system as well. And one of the things that excited me the most about playing Nintendo DS was the ability to use the touchscreen, but unfortunately it's not quite as responsive as I was thinking it would be. At least on this unit, I had a really hard time registering any of my touches on the bottom third of the screen itself. And unfortunately for games like Trauma Center Under the Night, it essentially makes the game unplayable. There seems to be a huge gap around the bottom band of my screen where the touches don't even register at all. And so unfortunately, if you planned on playing touchscreen Nintendo DS games on this system, you may be disappointed with how they actually play. Okay, so moving on, let's try Sega Dreamcast, and this is running with the ReDream emulator. And across the board, for the most part, Sega Dreamcast ran really well. And the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus is really well suited for Sega Dreamcast. And that's because the Dreamcast had an original aspect ratio of 4x3 with a resolution of 640x480, just like on this display. And so because of that, the Sega Dreamcast games just look naturally very good on this display. And in terms of performance, I would say that about 95% of games seem to play at just about full speed. Now, just like with the Saturn emulator, the ReDream emulator does use an auto frame skip to smooth out the experience. 
And if you turn off the auto frame skip, you are going to get some dips and stutters and things like that. But all the same, I never really seem to notice when I have the auto frame skip on by default. Either way, if you're looking forward to trying out Sega Dreamcast on the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus, I don't think you're going to be disappointed. The games that had issues were few and far between, but some of them were surprising. For example, with Marvel vs. Capcom 2, there were several different times that it bumped down to something like 35 or 40 frames per second. And it mostly happened during some of the bigger moves, but all the same, it's really disappointing for a fighting game to have slowdown like this. And as always, NBA 2K2 seems to be the highest benchmark for me when it comes to Dreamcast emulation, and unfortunately this one just can't reach 60 frames per second. So while most Dreamcast runs really well, there are going to be a few that aren't going to run perfectly. Okay, so now let's talk about PlayStation Portable. Now this is one that I'm a little bit torn about. For the most part, most games are going to play at a 1x resolution with zero problems. They're actually going to have no stutters or anything. And quite a few of them are actually going to play at a 2x resolution with only occasional stutters. But the problem is, a 3.5 inch display at a 4x3 aspect ratio doesn't really show PSP very well at all. And that's because the PSP was originally at something very close to 16x9. And so you're going to have these big bars at the top and the bottom, which is going to make your image that much smaller. And so because of that, it actually doesn't look that much better when you use a 2x resolution. And so my recommendation for PSP is actually just to leave it at a 1x resolution because most of the games are going to run really smoothly at that resolution. That way you don't have to fiddle around with settings and you can just guarantee a pretty good experience. And of course, all the usual suspects are going to give you problems. For example, OutRun 2006 does not play at full speed with a 1x resolution. You are going to have to turn on a frame skip of 1. And sadly, the God of War games, even with a frame skip of 1 and a 1x resolution, still don't run at full speed. I would expect to see about 85% performance across the board for both of these games. So coming into this review and with this display, I wasn't expecting great PSP performance anyway, but all the same, these games are playable for the most part. Okay, we've been at this for a while and we're about to jump into GameCube and PS2, but before that, I think we deserve a cat break. For those of you who are new to the channel, this is Chicken here, and she sits on my lap a lot of the time while I'm reviewing devices. And Chicken here is 13 years old, she's going on 14. Okay, that's enough for the break, let's jump into GameCube. Now before we get started with GameCube, I do want to make a plug for this Retro Handhelds Community Spreadsheet here. And this is specific to the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus, and I'll have it linked in the video description. But within this Google document, you're going to be able to go in and check all the different systems and then all the games that have been tested by the community and some of their recommended settings. And this spreadsheet is also editable, so if you want to jump in here and add some testing of your own, you're more than welcome to do so, the more the merrier. Now the point in showing this spreadsheet is the fact that it's almost a necessary component of trying to play GameCube or PS2 games. And that's because I think the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus was never really meant to run these systems at all. But with enough hacks and enhancements, you can actually get some fairly decent gameplay. But just to temper expectations, there are very few games that are going to run at full speed. For example, you have to downgrade the resolution to 70% of the native resolution, and you also have to turn off Google Play services, and then also use European or PAL ROMs because those run at a 50 frames per second cap. And so, if you're the type of person who gets excited about tweaking a device and seeing what kind of performance you can squeeze out of it, then I think this might be a good match for you. But I think if you're just looking for a device that can play GameCube across the board, this isn't going to be a very good fit because you could spend hours, even days, trying to do some tweaks and in the end you will probably be disappointed with the performance. This is just a device that's not powerful enough for GameCube across the board. That being said, some games do work pretty well. Sonic Heroes is mostly playable. Same thing with this random pitfall game that I tried out. This one actually seemed to run at just about full speed. And also Legend of Zelda Wind Waker does give you some pretty good performance. Usually at this part in the game you can see a little bit of slowdown when you move the camera around a lot, but as you can see here I'm getting basically no slowdown or stutters. That being said, Wind Waker at a 70% resolution does look remarkably worse than it does at a normal GameCube resolution, so the picture quality is a little bit disappointing, but all the same this seems to be fully playable. And if you want to play some simpler games, things like Mario Party 6, this one actually plays at full speed too. But across the board, it's going to be very experimental with any game that you try. For example, Need for Speed Most Wanted runs at exactly one frame per second. This is the worst emulation performance I've ever seen on GameCube across the board. I mean, it's pretty cool that it actually plays, but all the same, one frame per second is kind of hilarious. And one last note here is that the thing with GameCube and PS2 games is that a lot of them rely on the right analog stick. And that's really where this right analog slider really starts to make the experience suffer. Because playing something like a first person shooter using that analog slider for me is just really not fun. 
Either way, GameCube is an option on this device if you're willing to put the time in and you have a good amount of patience. So now let's try PS2, and unfortunately the performance is actually a little bit worse with PS2 than it is with GameCube. Now for this PS2 setup, I ended up throwing basically every enhancement and hack that I could at the emulator. But even then, across the board, I found that performance was quite a bit slower than what I would consider to be playable. And of course, this is no fault of the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. This is a device that was never meant to play PlayStation 2 in the first place. I think we're still about a generation away from good PS2 gameplay on a retro handheld device, at least at this budget price. And truth be told, the fact that this can play PlayStation 2 at all for under $100 is kind of amazing. Either way, just like with GameCube, I would say don't get your hopes up. But if you're the kind of person who doesn't mind doing tweaking and you have a good amount of patience when it comes to all of this, then yeah, maybe go for it. And you know the Aether SX2 emulator is still in its testing phase, so I don't have high expectations of it in the first place, and honestly it's really impressive for what it can do already. But unless there's some sort of revolutionary upgrade to this emulator, I really don't expect to see Retroid Pocket 2 Plus being able to play PS2 reliably. As far as PS2 performance, I actually think that Simpsons Hidden Run was the best performing of all the games I tested. Which was kind of surprising, but all the same, this was a pretty fun experience. Okay, so that's it for PS2, let's move on to Android and streaming. One nice thing about these Google Play Store games is that many of them scale automatically to the 4x3 aspect ratio of the display, so things like Horizon Chase or even Beach Buggy Racing, they actually play at the native resolution and they look pretty good. Same thing with Stardew Valley, this is a game you enjoy playing on your phone, I think you'll enjoy it even more on this device thanks to having native buttons. One other thing I noticed is that this device has an internal gyroscope. For example, when I was trying Real Racing 3, I noticed that when I rotated the device itself, it would also rotate the display correspondingly. So that actually leaves open a world of possibilities when it comes to gyroscope-based games, or even emulators that can support gyroscope controls. When it comes to Android games, the thing that limits the performance the most is actually the display, and that's because a lot of these games were made for a higher resolution. For example, Asphalt 9 usually looks amazing on phones, but on the 480p display of the Retroid Pocket 2, I just came away feeling kind of unimpressed. And other games that have really good performance actually look terrible. For example, Dead Cells is a game that runs really well, but unfortunately because of the display, the text is actually illegible. And while that might not be a big thing when it comes to the storyline, because I don't know how much of story there actually is in this game, it does become quite a pain when you're trying to, for example, upgrade your weapons. Because you can't actually read any of the attributes of the weapons or your upgrades or things like that. And so you're basically just playing this game blind. And so unfortunately, Dead Cells is not a game that I would recommend playing on this device. Now one last note is that this device has a built-in key mapper. So that means for touchscreen games you can actually map keys to the buttons. And it's hidden on the right side of the display here which you can swipe to the left to bring up. And there's a couple different things you can do in here, for example you can free up RAM. But the main thing I want to show off here is the key mapping function. What you do is you tap the key mapper button here, and then you basically just move over your buttons to correspond to wherever you want them to push on the screen. And it takes a couple minutes to set up, but it's actually pretty easy and it saves per game. On top of that you can import and export configurations and share them with your friends. And so once you have that all set up, you can actually use your buttons in place of touch controls. And this will be handy for certain games that don't support controllers, like in the Call of Duty tutorial. Now that being said, when it comes to aiming, I found that the right analog slider is just about terrible, and I prefer to use the touchscreen anyway. So you may end up using a combination of both touchscreen and button controls, but it is nice to have that choice. Okay, so now let's talk about the HDMI out function of this device. It uses a micro HDMI connection, and it does turn the screen off when you have it hooked up. When it comes to the display, it actually forces a 4x3 aspect ratio, which is going to be really handy when it comes to classic gaming. Because that way it's not going to stretch out the image to a 16x9 display on your TV. Instead it's going to keep it to the native 4x3. But yeah, overall I think the HDMI function works really well. Now I personally had some audio issues, I wasn't able to capture the correct audio, and that might have been the fault of my capture card or even my HDMI cable, I think I just need to do some more testing on it. I also tested it out and Bluetooth works really well on this device as well, so you could essentially use the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus as a standalone home console. You could plug it into your TV and then connect to a controller either through Bluetooth or the USB connector, and then treat this like a retro gaming console. Now last note about HDMI is that regardless of what system you play, it's still going to force a 4x3 aspect ratio. So if you want to play something like an Android game, it's still going to push it to a 4x3 signal. And that's not the end of the world, but just something to keep in mind in case you were looking forward to widescreen gaming on the TV.
Okay, let's move over to game streaming. So across the board, the performance was actually pretty good, and a lot of that is thanks to the 5 GHz Wi-Fi connection that is available inside this device. That being said, it suffers from the same problem as PSP in the fact that most of the display is going to show at 16x9 with things like Google Stadia or streaming from your PlayStation or Xbox. But if you're willing to live with these black bars and the smaller display on this device, then you might have a good time when it comes to game streaming. Now if you use something like Moonlight, you actually are able to stretch it to a full screen. And that might be good for some games, but for the 16x9 games, it's going to look a little bit weird. For example, here's Celeste on the PC, and she just looks so weird and squished because of the 4x3 aspect ratio. But if you want to use something like Moonlight to then stream like a dolphin emulator from your PC onto the device, then it's going to look really nice. And so this might be a solution if there are some GameCube games that you want to play, you can just stream them from your PC onto the device, and no one's the wiser. And so when it comes to GameCube and PS2, if you don't mind streaming from your PC, then not all hope is lost, because these work pretty dang well. And of course, there's a lot of caveats with that. For example, you're going to need to have a PC that can run these in the first place, but all the same, this is an option available to you. Okay, we've been at this forever, so let's start summing things up. We'll start with what I like and what I don't like about this device. When it comes to price to performance, there is nothing that can beat the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. For $100 plus shipping, you're looking at a device that can play all the way up through Dreamcast with minimal issues. And there's nothing on the market at that price point that can compare to this. On top of that, I appreciate that they improved the D-pad and face buttons, and I've always liked the stack trigger buttons on this device. The added touchscreen is also a welcome change, it makes navigating through everything so much easier. I also appreciate the fact that the company continues to support the device after launch. Already over the past couple weeks, we've seen four updates pushed over the air. And I'm hoping that the front end launcher, which is really good already, gets even better over time. Right now, I would consider it a work in progress, but I'm hoping that the company does update it in the future. In particular, when it comes to performance, I think Nintendo 64, Dreamcast, and Nintendo DS really shine on this, as long as you aren't expecting really good touch controls for the Nintendo DS side. And I think all the additional features, things like 5 GHz Wi-Fi, Bluetooth 5.0, and an HDMI output, all come together to make this a device worth considering. So now let's talk about the things that I don't like. And I don't really have that many things to nitpick, but this is what I have. Number one, I do not like this right analog slider. I hope that in the end, they're going to fix this for the Retroid Pocket 3. I appreciate that the company was thoughtful and maybe considered this to be a feature that we wanted, but I think time has shown that this is one of the weaker parts of this device. On top of that, the lack of L3 and R3 does limit some control functionality when it comes to some of those higher end systems. And overall, if I had to summarize this device, I would say that it's actually limited by its screen. And I think Android games are a great example. The performance is great on many games, but some like Dead Cells are actually unplayable because you can't actually read the text because the resolution on this device is just too low. And finally, I had a few hardware setbacks when it came to this device. The colored buttons in particular seemed to stick on my device. And I wasn't able to get HDMI audio working perfectly, but again, that's something I need to work on a little bit more on my end too. So in the end, I don't have a lot of bad things to say about this device. And so what does that mean when it comes to my recommendation of whether or not you should buy this device? And I think that wholeheartedly you should consider purchasing this device if you're in the market for a handheld and you have a budget of about $100. At this price point, there is no other device that can compete with it from a performance perspective. And sure, there are some things that annoy me about it, but all the same, at this price point, there's no better value out there in the retro handheld community today. So that's really about it for this video. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below, and I'll also have a link to buy the device in the video description. It's a non-affiliate link, so I'm earning no money from this. I just really like this device. And as always, thanks for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming. Thank you.